me start by asking you a few questions. Do you ever stop and think during a romantic dinner that you just left fingerprints all over your wine glass? Or when you visit your friends, do you ever worry that you're leaving a little piece of you behind with any surface that you touch? And even now, have you sat by paying any attention not to touch anything? I guess the answer is no. And thankfully, you're not alone because criminals underestimate the power of fingerprints too. And fingerprints have been around for over 100 years and the, the police uses the process to match them to a suspect using a database of records. And what they do, they use this pattern of lines, which, which are unique to each one of us, called bridges. And the process works, but we do have some issues. You can see them here. So what if the fingerprint is very faint or partial, or if it is very smudged or distorted or uh, overlaps another fingerprint? Never mind those that actually have not been convicted before, and therefore the fingerprints will not be a record. So the evidential value of the fingerprint is lost here. But thankfully, fingerprints are not just a beautifully twisted pattern of lines, but they're made of sweat, and as such, they contain lots of molecules, including those that, have, that are present on your fingertips. Somehow they come in contact. And that's the idea, because these molecules and their identity can tell a lot about a suspect a lot about the lifestyle and the activities, so potentially providing lots of intelligence to the investigators. And how do we tease out this intelligence? At Sheffield Alam University, we use an analytical technique called mass spectrometry. And as the name suggests, it measures the mass of things. And you can think of it as sophisticated scales, but for molecules. So with our conventional scales, we can say the Julie weighs nine stones, and with mass spectrometry, we can say that something as little as caffeine weighs 194 dolphins. But there is a difference between us as people and molecules, because you can't get away with eating like I've done. I've given my best eating performance last Christmas at the Freud Cafe in Vienna. You can't get away with this. So while our weight may change before and after Christmas, then thankfully, Molecules don't care about that. They always weigh the same. And therefore, we can use this unique constant property as an identifying property of our molecules. We, use, we have developed a particular application of mass spectrometry called MOLDI, and that use, uses lasers. And here we use a laser to automatically fire on the fingerprint in a raster fashion. And every time you fire on a fingerprint, then you collect this item here. This is a graph with lines and numbers, but each number actually refers to a specific molecule. And so we can identify those molecules. And so we collect all of this spectra, and then what we do, we actually interrogate a software as to give us the visualization of the distribution of all the molecules that we've detected in the fingerprint. And in so doing, you're actually able to reconstruct the ridge pattern. And because in one analysis we detect hundreds of molecules, we also obtain hundreds of images of the same fingerprint. And that's really powerful and a big advantage compared to normal forensic techniques, which just give us the one image of the fingerprint. So what we can do then with this intelligence well, we can use it for extracting additional physical intelligence. For example, you can superimpose lots of those fingerprint images to improve the ridge continuity, or you can stitch images together to complete the ridge pattern, and therefore giving the police more chances to actually identify that fingerprint. Overlapping fingerprints are quite nasty to work with, and we need to separate them. And now with mass spectrometry, we can do this. So we can recall individual images from individual molecules that are more abundant in one fingerprint rather than the other one. And actually, this is very important because, for example, we can separate the ridge pattern of an assailant from that of the victim. And so this is really very powerful information. But what about the chemical information? 
Well, it is known that the changes in abundance of our molecules in our system can actually act as an indicator of physiological, biological, pharmaceutical, pathological state, thus categorizing the individual. So what I'm hinting at here is that by pinpointing those changes, we may be able in the future, not very distant future, to actually answer the impossible. From just the chemistry of the fingerprint, we could, for example, say if the person is a meat eater or a vegetarian, what kind of disease he has. And we've started from another angle. We've asked the question, is it actually possible to tell the sex of the individual just by looking at a fingerprint? And we've looked at a specific class of biomolecules, peptides. This is, well, before you saw the profile of my own fingerprint containing these peptides. And the idea is that we found out that males and females have different relative abundance of these peptides, and they're very distinctive. So you are always going to get a certain profile for a male and a certain profile for a female. And so we apply statistical modeling to automatically discriminate fingerprints from the two sexes just by looking at their uh, peptide and protein content. And we can do this with the 85% of confidence, which is a good number, but there's still some work to do. We've engaged in a big trial with West Yorkshire Police, so hopefully this confidence will increase. But what about external contaminants? So we worked on condom lubricants. We can tell what condom have you used. Well, if you use the condom, and what condom you've used. Um, and this is actually quite important because it could provide some uh, corroborative evidence to the investigator. And the fact that we can visualize the condom lubricants on the ridges of the fingerprint actually provides the link between the suspect identity and the evidence that the crime has been committed. Of course, here we are after the rapists, who watch a little too much CSI and think they can get away and fool the investigators just by wearing a condom. In fact, we can tell something else. The lawyers could say, right, you find this condom lubricant on the fingerprint, but the condom lubricant could have been there on the surface before as a result of a prior sexual activity, or my client has been framed. Okay, well, let's put this to the test. So, suppose that you have a contaminated finger mark and a clean surface. So, clean surface, I've got my fingertip contaminated with the condom lubricant, I then touch the surface, and actually by doing this, I expect the condom lubricant to be present only on the ridges of the fingerprint. And this is exactly what I obtain. Well, let's do the reverse. If the surface is now dirty with condom lubricant, and I have my clean fingertip touching it, where do you expect to find the condom lubricant? I hear everywhere, and that's exactly what I'm getting here. So that orangey color is not just present on the ridges, but everywhere on the surface as well. And to further pro prove this, because you know now that we can detect hundreds of molecules at the same time, I'm going to just recall an image of one fatty acid that we have, all of us have, and you can see here that that's solidly distributed on the ridges, just proving again the fact that it's only the condom lubricant that was pre-existing on the surface and present everywhere. How about blood? Blood is one of the contaminants mostly found at violent, um, as, uh, scenes of violent crimes. So, Moldy can actually visualize the presence of blood even when conventional techniques fail to do this. And the other important thing is that conventional forensic tests are presumptive, so they can give you false positives, which means that they can say, yeah, that's blood, indeed, that's semen or some other biological fluid. So, there is this risk. But our technique is very specific, as you can see here, we can say the blood is there because we can specifically detect this molecule here, which is present on the hemoglobin protein 
and is an oxygen carrier. This is another example where instead we have detected hemoglobin, so the entire protein, from a blood print which was previously developed, that's, that's what we say, with a forensic technique. And now the beauty of this as well is that this palm print was nine year old. So we can now access cold cases too. I couldn't resist showing this again, some of you may know this slide already, but we can also detect substances that you've ingested. So I tested myself, I drank a nice cup of, I'm sorry, Italian coffee, and, <laughs> and then I tested my own fingerprint at different times. And I could see an increase of the caffeine signal from 10 minutes to 30 minutes to one hour. And please also see the correlation between the increase of the peak with my ability to multitask, yeah? What else? Because we were intrigued by the possibility of detecting substances that we somehow introduce in our body, we've developed a methodology to possibly be applied to patient compliance. So we got some fingertip smears from patients in rehabilitation clinic. So this is a real case. And we were expecting to obviously, being a drug rehabilitation clinic, to find methadone, which we did. That's it. But we weren't expecting to find also THC and the metabolite of cocaine. So the key message here is also that this particular patient wasn't rehabilitating all too well. <laughs> and the research progressed so well that actually we were allowed by our partner, West Yorkshire Police, to go to crime scenes, collect the marks, and actually translate our laboratory protocols in the field. This is an example of a smudged mark, which was developed by their own techniques, given to us, and this was on a stolen and found laptop. And we managed to actually detect the presence of cocaine and one of the metabolites, which is telling us that this person is not simply a drug dealer, but being a metabolite there, the person has actually taken the drug. And in another mark, we found a metabolite called cocaethylene. Now, this is only formed if you take cocaine and alcohol at the same time. So this, this tells us a lot about the, the state of mind of the individual and can inform the investigations very significantly. I think we're getting there. I don't think it's going to be very long now until we can apply this technology in the field. But don't hear this from me. Hear it from West Yorkshire Police. Well, the potential of this technique for fingerprints is, is quite revolutionary. It can help us to make poor fingerprints clearer. It could potentially help us to, to sex a fingerprint so we know what gender the perpetrator of the crime is. It can give us intelligence about um, the individual who left the finger mark behind. And it might even help us to age fingerprints because that is still a problem that we have that we may be able to identify a fingerprint but we don't know how long it's been left at that crime scene. This technique could help us to do that more accurately. And as you can imagine, this work has attracted a lot of interest by the media. And in one of the shows, uh, the, the, the one show, this was defined as the future of fingerprinting. And I agree with that, because this is our way to actually do a different type of chemical profile, or sorry, of, of criminal profiling, which is not based on behavioral science, but on chemistry. Remember, fingerprints are your secret your secrets in a touch. Thanks very much. <laughs>